Professor, if you'd like to share your screen with us or you want to wait me for your um, I can do that. Por favor, le damos permiso al profesor de compartir su pantalla. Okay. Let me find it here. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, good morning and welcome everybody to the Online International Congress of Neuroscience 2020. It is a pleasure for me to coordinate this important knowledge exchange scenario. My name is Estefania Junca, and along with Juan Camilo Tovar, I will be accompanying you as room moderator. As a quick reminder of the dynamics, the session will have a total duration of 40 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes for the round of questions. Please write your question or questions in the group chat, and Juan Camilo and I will be reading them to our speaker. I will be informing when time is running out five minutes and one minute before the end of the presentation. Les recuerdo a nuestros participantes que pueden elegir escuchar la presentación en español dando clic en la opción de interpretación ubicada en la esquina inferior derecha del menú. Before we begin, let me introduce you to our special guest, Professor Gary D. Bernstein. Professor Bernstein completed his PhD in 1971 at the University of Minnesota and is now a full professor at Ohio State University. He is an expert in psychophysiology, neuroscience, biological psychology, and, to, and together with his colleague, John Cacciopo, the founding father of social neuroscience. His research attempts to elucidate the functional organization of brain mechanisms underlying behavioral and affective processes with a special emphasis on social cognition. For today's plenary session, Professor Bernstein will be talking to us about social isolation, loneliness and health in the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for your time and participation in this Congress. Now, Professor Bernstein, may I ask you if you included the authorization for the recording of audiovisual content? Yes. Do you have any conflict of interest to, to express? No. Okay, thank you very much. With no more preambles, we now welcome Professor Bernstein. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, but travel is, is complicated these days. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is some of our work on uh, social isolation and health, and, and, and in, in one case, a particular pathway by which uh, social factors can impact health. Loneliness is a, a serious health risk. Uh, the odds ratio for dying early uh, for loneliness is 64%. And this risk factor compares to things like smoking, drinking, inactivity, obesity. It is an incredibly important, in, uh, has an incredibly important impact on health. It is also more prevalent than uh, other risk factors. So we're not dealing with trivial effects here. Loneliness, <laughs> has been increasing progressively. Uh, in the 1980s, approximately 20% of people said they felt lonely at any given time. By 2015, that was 43%. We're seeing a progressive increase in the number of uh, single person households, at least in the US. Our former Surgeon General uh, has declared loneliness to be an epidemic. It doesn't respect income, gender, education, ethnicity, 
And uh, loneliness has often been thought to reflect a dysfunctional aversive state with no redeeming qualities. John Cassiopo and, and I have a different perspective. Loneliness is, is important, especially important not to be lonely, but it is important from our evolutionary heritage. There is a need for social support, for defense against predators, for provisions of food. And so the appearance or the occurrence of loneliness is really a evolutionary cry to reestablish social contact. And it is uh, defined by the discrepancy between our desired and our actual social bonds. And it's not the number of people we know, it's not the size of our social circle, it's the perception it may only take one person to alleviate loneliness. Obviously, pandemic is exacerbating the problem of loneliness. We're seeing uh, an increase in the perception of loneliness. Um, 28% of women, 16% of men, men reported feeling more lonely because of the, comp, of the pandemic. Uh, and for Australians, this was the most common personal stress for identified. But not as only is it associated with a emotional or affective disquietude, Loneliness reduces the effectiveness of an influenza vaccine. And now that we're all looking for a COVID vaccine, one might expect the same outcome. So I want to uh, explain the a, a, a stream of research we've completed in, in conjunction with the University of Chicago and the Chicago Health Aging and Social Relations Study. John Cassiopo was a principal investigator there. This was a longitudinal population-based study of middle-aged and older adults uh, with multiple health statistics, physiological, endocrinological, and immunological. And let me remind us all of the, our friend, the autonomic nervous system, that system that regulates bodily functions comprised of a parasympathetic branch, sometimes referred to as cholinergic because of the acetylcholine, neurotransmitter used at effector junctions, a system that is uh, heavily involved in, in digestion, in energy intake, in conservation, in quiescence. And in contrast, the sympathetic or adrenergic system because of the catecholamine norepinephrine, uh, epinephrine neurotransmitters, a mobilization function, activation, participates heavily in fight and flight, enhances met metabolism, promotes energy utilization. We'll be looking at the role of these systems in our research. Although the autonomic nervous system is often considered to be reflexively regulated, in fact, we now know that there are major descending pathways 
from the cortex, from the limbic system that can modulate autonomic activity and impact the function of the autonomic nervous system. I'll illustrate with one uh, recent example from Island Witzstein, uh, what he terms stress cardiomyopathy. Previously described by Japanese cardiologists as Takasubo cardiomyopathy because of the characteristic appearance of the heart. It's a contrast agent. Note the ballooning out here at the ventricle that should be tight, that should be pumping blood. It's characterized uh, by a number of pathological features and often presents as a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, sometimes called left ventricular apical ballooning because of the lack of ventricular contraction or myocardial stunning, or as declared by the New England Journal of Medicine, broken heart syndrome. It just so happens that Wittstein's first paper on this subject came out just before Valentine's Day. Uh, and uh, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine picked up on that relationship. And you now sometimes see broken heart syndrome appearing in the clinical literature. It appears to be a heart attack, but it's not. There's minimal ischemia. You don't see the typical elevation in cardiac enzymes associated with a heart attack. But what you do see is an exaggerated stress cardiomyopathy, uh, an exaggerated level of catecholamines, dopa epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, even higher than a so-called kill of class three myocardial infarction or heart attack. It reflects an exaggerated sympathoadrenal state. And uh, you can also sometimes see this with dobutamine treatment or uh, field chromocytoma, which is a, a, a secreting tumor in the adrenal medulla uh, or cocaine induced catecholamine release. And it can be triggered by something as innocuous as an argument or a trip and a fall or a surprise birthday party. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in the world. Both the US, Colombia, and elsewhere. With over 7.4 million people a year suffering from a heart attack, myocardial infarction, the cost in the US exceeds $600 billion per year. Um, and, and just a, a, a brief comment. Uh oh. Get back here. Uh, myocardial ischemia, also MI, is sometimes confused with myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is the infarction or the damage to the cardiac tissue it often results from ischemia or the loss of blood flow. So we know from the literature that sympathetic uh, drive is a risk factor for myocardial infection and sudden cardiac death and subsequent cardiac episodes, whereas the parasympathetic system seems to exert protective effects. We wanted to look at the role of, of these 
two branches more thoroughly, we often uh, have considered the parasympathetic and sympathetic system to be reciprocally regulated along this bipolar continuum. But in fact, it is now clear that these branches can operate independently, coactively, reciprocally. And so a more comprehensive view of the autonomic space is this bivariate uh, uh, model. So we have sympathetic, which is a negative predictor and parasympathetic positive predictor of effective of, of, of um, health. Uh, and so we wanted to look at that dimension. Let's, let's capture a metric that reflects where along this continuum the autonomic system resides or is regulated. But we also wanted to look at the potential uh, contributions of coactive changes, changes in the combined effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic. This we term cardiac autonomic regulation, which is the overall aggregate of autonomic control. And we use as measures in this study, in the human study, uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is the variation in heartbeat with respiration. It is mediated largely or exclusively almost by the parasympathetic nervous system. And for the sympathetic metric, we use pre-ejection period derived from impedance cardiography which is the time between the EKGQ wave illustrated here and the onset of aortic ejection, the opening of the aortic valve and the flow of blood from the ventricles to the circulatory system. So here's the outcome from these 220 people. High cardiac sympathetic tone and low parasympathetic tone, um, that is low cab, was a predictor of diabetes. And we kind of understood this because we are aware of the fact that, uh, that diabetes is often triggered or associated with an autoimmune attack on the uh, secretory cells of insulin, and that's fostered by sympathetic tone. We also found that high parasympathetic tone and high CAR up here were uh, positive predictors of overall health status. And finally, that low parasympathetic tone uh, and low CAR were significant pred predictors of heart attack in both prospective and retrospective cases. So this low level of overall of autonomic control seems to uh, be a risk factor for heart attack. And this was this decrease in parasympathetic tone characteristic of, of um, people with heart attack was moderated by social support. Here is a graphic illustrating um, the parasympathetic control in non-MI patients here in 
those with high social support and here in those with low social support. So low social support contributes to this lowering of overall parasympathetic control. And we wanted to look at this in a animal model where we could evaluate the physiology and some of the pathways. So we used a cardiac arrest model in mice, uh, which had been developed by one of my uh, colleagues, Courtney DeVry, in which uh, uh, an injection of potassium chloride stops the heart after eight minutes, the uh, resuscitation is begun, which entails pretty much the standard human clinical resuscitation parameters, 100% oxygen, epinephrine, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And we ran the study under two conditions. One was where animals were pair housed as usual. That's a typical uh, arrangement. Uh, mice are social animals. They like other mice and they like to be with other mice or socially isolated for uh, 10 days before the insult. Uh, and again, we used respiratory sinus arrhythmia as one marker of parasympathetic control. We also used pharmacological blockades of the selective branches, sympathetic and parasympathetic to evaluate the overall level of activity in these branches. What we found was that singly housed animals showed a survival rate of about half, a double of the doubling of the um, death rate of animals who were pair housed. We know that social isolation decreases parasympathetic control. And those animals who died showed, as was the case with the human subject showed lower parasympathetic control than those who survived. We also know that reduced parasympathetic control is correlated with uh, increase in central pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, IL-1B. We see an increase in fluoro jade markers of cell death illustrated here uh, and MAC1 staining uh, microglial activation. Both of these indicators of inflammation and uh, neuronecrosis and note the exaggerated extent of these processes in socially isolated animals compared to pair housed animals. as was the case with myocardial infarction in humans. Uh, cardiac arrest in mice was associated with a chronic decrease in parasympathetic and sympathetic control after an initial spike, uh, a prolonged decrease in, <coughs> excuse me, sympathetic as well as parasympathetic control. Interleukin-6, again, a pro-inflammatory cytokine, reflective of inflammatory states, inversely related to survival uh, following MI in humans, and the same relationship obtained in the mice. IL-6, we found, was also related to parasympathetic control in an inverse fashion. Higher levels of IL-6 associated with lower levels of parasympathetic control. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> 
So again, this inflammatory marker was highly related to the level of parasympathetic autonomic activity. And I'll come back to this in the next slide, but briefly to introduce the brain inflammatory effects of social isolation could be eliminated by GTS-21, which is a parasympathetic alpha nicotinic cholinergic receptor agonist. So it eliminated largely the inflammatory brain effects of social isolation. So again, in humans, we found that social support was, uh, was reduced by myocardial infarction, a low level of, or I'm, I'm sorry, parasympathetic control was, was reduced uh, and more so in individuals with low levels of social support than with individuals with high level of social support. We found a similar relationship in mice. Uh, incidentally, this light green shows the overall average. Uh, here is parasympathetic control before cardiac arrest here in pair housed animals and here in isolated animals. And again, uh, the effects were largely reversed by GTS-21, which has an anti-inflammatory action uh, on cytokine production on immune function in general and dampens this neuroinflammation and increases survival rate comparable to pair housing. So social isolation, uh, as I mentioned earlier, reduces parasympathetic control. That's illustrated here. You can see in isolated animals that the level of RSA or parasympathetic control is rather strikingly diminished uh, four weeks after cardiac arrest, but not in an isolated group that received oxytocin. So oxytocin protected against this decrease in parasympathetic control. It decreases pro-inflammatory cytokines and improves survival in isolated animals comparable to pair housing. Here is the level of uh, IL-1B, an inflammatory cytokine in the uh, animals who were isolated with placebo injections of cerebral spinal fluid, and here in animals who received oxytocin to the right, a dramatic reduction in the level of this pro-inflammatory cytokine. In contrast, if you administer an oxytocin antagonist, uh, uh, an agent that blocks the oxytocin receptor, it has the opposite effect of increasing pro-inflammatory cytokines. And in fact, it blocks the ameliorative effect of social housing. So we've got these multiple factors here, social housing, parasympathetic control, oxytocin somehow in the mix. 
paraventricular nucleus uh, of the hypothalamus uh, is the source of an, of an excitatory projection to the premotor cardiac vagal neurons uh, that co-release oxytocin and as a result increase parasympathetic control. And there is a growing interest these days in, in optogenetic and chemogenetic approaches uh, to deciphering some of the neurochemistry and pharmacology of these pathways and interactions between the oxytocinergic pathway and the enhancement of parasympathetic control. One striking example is a uh, study by Pino, the green areas here are fluorescent oxytocin neurons, and uh, they had a, a genetic um, a preparation of mice which responded specifically to light. So they could turn on these neurons by sh shining locally a little light emitting diode uh, and sort of track how this system is working. Uh, so we've got some well-defined pathways now by which oxytocin regulates parasympathetic control, which in turn impacts on cardiac health. So in a final study in humans, we wanted to look at what, if, what effects there were of oxytocin injected intranasally at 10 micrograms. It increases both sympathetic and parasympathetic control, as to say, it increases CAR, activating both autonomic branches and enhancing overall autonomic control. But there's a caveat, oxytocin continues to increase sympathetic activity in both lonely and non-lonely individuals, but with increasing levels of loneliness here, the UCLA loneliness scale, there is a progressive decrease in the parasympathetic enhancements from oxytocin and consequently an overall reduction in CAR. So a nominally potentially health promoting effect of oxytocin, elevation of autonomic control is largely limited to less lonely people. The loneliness, the lonely don't not only not benefit, but they're left with this enhanced sympathetic activity, which is a risk factor for health outcomes. So where to go from here? We, we certainly need further research on understanding these pathways. We, we've known for centuries that psychological stress, environmental factors can impact health. We're only recently identifying specific routes by which that those impacts occur. And we need further development of remedial strategies 
to deal with loneliness. Meanwhile, we'll wait for a vaccine, wear a mask, wash your hands, physically distance. Do not socially distance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you my, very much, Professor Bertson. Before we begin with our round of questions, I would like you to invite you, if you're okay with it, to turn on your camera. Okay, yep. If I can get there. I look better in the picture. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you for your time, Professor. Thank you. We really appreciate you being here, taking the time to share your knowledge with us. So we now uh, have an, anonym, an anonymous question. I will read it for you. It says, the literature reports the positive effect of parasympathetic system training through heart rate variability. And do you believe it, it is reliable to believe that this training may have a protective effect on the heart as well as cognitive effective one? The cognitive. Um, repeat the question, please. Okay, so it says, the literature reports the positive effect of parasympathetic system training through heart rate variability. Do you believe it is reliable to believe that this training may have a protective effect on the heart as well as a cognitive effective one? Oh, it very, very much so. It, 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 it could very well be, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so. Professor, do you think, do you think this this research should be taken into account when taking health uh, decisions uh, worldwide in the face of this pandemic? Absolutely, there are um, uh, there are, there are some approaches. Uh, we've fortunately we have things these days like Zoom. Uh, but it is, it is incredibly important from not just the standpoint of the heart, but you may recall the, the slide, the high levels of CAR, parasympathetic and autonomic balance, were associated with overall markers of health status uh, across the board and reductions in risk factors. So I, I think this is absolutely an important consideration. And, and you, you, you saw the, the numbers. Loneliness is a greater risk factor than obesity, than smoking. Uh, it would be foolhardy not to con consider incorporating this into our healthcare system. Okay, thank you, Professor. We have another question from Melissa Cardenas. She says that according to studies um, made uh, with people that practice meditation, uh, they train their sympathetic, parasympathetic um, responses as well as stress levels. Do you believe meditation can be a protective factor for people that live alone? Absolutely. Uh, uh, and there's, there's ample evidence now that, that uh, meditational strategies can enhance parasympathetic activity and dampen sympathetic. So, so um, it, you know, what's cause and what's effect, th there certainly is a pathway through the autonomic nervous system in which, by which uh, meditation strategies uh, or other uh, uh, psychological practices um, can impact positively 
impact health. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. We have another question. It says, uh, besides the effects of stress in the heart and the brain, are you aware of any repercussions of loneliness uh, to the lungs? Have bearing in mind that COVID-19 enters first through this organ? Yeah, good question. Uh, there, <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any specific uh, investigation on, on the lungs. However, the pneumonia uh, associated with COVID assault is an, is, is an inflammatory event. As a matter of fact, you've probably heard the term cytokine storm. There's an overreaction uh, that leads to increased inflammation. And uh, you know, one of the treatment strategies these days is to try and dampen that autoimmune response with say something like steroids. Uh, so I think it's very relevant uh, uh, to the current COVID issue. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Juan David. It says, Professor, are you aware of policymakers in the U.S. or elsewhere taking these important issues into consideration? Mostly talk so far. Um, I think people are beginning to recognize it. We, you know, we, we hear at the uh, uh, OSU hospital uh, do have an increased emphasis and presence of social service agents in the hospital that that um, are aware of these considerations. It's just, it's, it's a difficult to manage when you've got somebody in a nursing home, say, uh, that, um, that's lonely. You know, how, how do we set up a system? And there are conceivable ways uh, of doing so to m increase that person to person contact, not necessarily even physically. Uh, so it, is it being adequately addressed? No, but I think it's, people are starting to recognize the importance. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, another question says, considering this scenario, do you think it is possible that the vulnerability of the immune system and the autonomic nervous system in people with conditions of isolation and loneliness made these people more vulnerable to the effects of this pandemic? Uh, absolutely. Um, they're, they're, the immune system and the autonomic nervous system are closely Integrated. I mean, we used to think of them as sort of separate domains. They're not. They're all closely uh, uh, reciprocally coupled. And so any imbalance uh, in one of those it can impact the other, such as the inflammatory aspect. And um, that could absolutely predispose somebody to either uh, increased likelihood of contracting or increasing the severity of the COVID assault. Okay, thank you. We have very interesting questions here. One says, due to changes in oxytocin during maternity, do you think it could be considered as a protective factor for a mother and child? In, in which way? Uh, would you repeat that? Due to oxytocin changes during maternity, do you think this could be considered as a protective factor for mother and child, and in which way? Oh, uh, a good question. I, you know, I, 
I don't know the answer to that. I hadn't really reflected, but it's it's something that's certainly worth looking into. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and the same person has another question, and she asks, um, "How did you apply all this knowledge to your way of handling the pandemic?" Um. How do you answer that? I I pretty much stay at home, <laughs> um, and you know I'm 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 older. Uh, I have uh, pre-existing conditions, so so I'm following my own advice. But uh, we have regular Zoom meetings and conversations, and so we can maintain some level of social support and social contact while diminishing the physical, uh, uh, maintaining a physical distance. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Another question says, um, chronic social isolation is associated with increased cytokines and hyperactivity of the pituitary hypothalamic adrenal axis has shown cognitive changes in processes such as memory and learning in humans? Yes, absolutely it can. Um, again, uh, these systems are, are integrated. They're not isolated. You will see uh, things like corticosteroid effects on the brain, on the hippocampus. And that is one area where, which is important in memory. Uh, not, not to mention emotional factors. So uh, th these things are all pretty much tied together. And it's uh, increasingly becoming apparent um, that you can't isolate them, that there is no real meaningful separation between, say, mind and body. Uh, they're one and the same. Okay, so we have another question and it is about the, the role of the family of a patient with cardiac um, illnesses and how could they get benefit from this oxytocin um, increase for the patient? <clears throat> That it's an interesting question. In fact, uh, sometimes family can be deleterious uh, if it is not a harmonious relationship. Um, but I, I think for the most part, all we can say is that, uh, you know, family support is important and we should try and foster a positive family interaction that would would have the benefits social benefits without or with min while minimizing potential conflicts and negative consequences okay thank you Here, uh, david says regarding practices such as mindfulness or meditation do you think that they could be effective interventions to modulate the parasympathetic system and in this way reduce the harmful effects of social isolation? The, I, I, I think they have been in some areas. Uh, this is kind of, this is kind of new to the medical profession uh, that we're talking about things like mindfulness and, and relaxation uh, because that's not the way typically the medical profession has been educated or thought about uh, uh, health issues. I think that's changing, it's changing slowly. And yes, I think there is a role for uh, meditation, for mindfulness, for uh, psychological factors in contributing to positive health outcomes. Okay, we have another pretty interesting question from Octavio. He asks, 
could there be any differences between the sympathetic and parasympathetic responses induced by loneliness, induced by entities external to the individual, for example, um, uh, governam, um, from the government, uh, differentiated from the, um, from the ones that we as, as a person decide to have? Um, ask that question again. Yeah, could there be any differences between the sympathetic and parasympathetic responses depending on, on whether I decide to isolate myself or I have to follow a recommendation oh, from an I, external I, I, entity? I, yeah, yeah, I, I see the question. Um, yeah, I think there likely are differences. Uh, social isolation as, as I alluded to, uh, or perceived social isolation, uh, isn't related to the number of people around you. I mean, indirectly it is. It's the perception of loneliness, the perception of lack of contact. And if that's self-imposed, um, it's, it's purposeful, it's, it's a strategy to deal with an issue. If it's externally imposed, uh, uh, it could be stressful. So yeah, there could be very well be big differences in reactions to isolation if it's self-imposed as opposed to government imposed. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one of our attendees, Blandina, says, do you think it plausible to develop a kind of screening uh, done by the health services directed to, towards vulnerable populations in order to prevent the effects of isolation? I think it's possible. I think it is not cheap necessarily. I mean, if you take a nursing home situation, for example, um, at, in, in this country, at least they're profit-making operations. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to, to get the staffing necessary, <clears throat> but there are some creative ways. I, I think that, that this could be dealt with more effectively, even with restricted physical uh, contact. Uh, it's going to take some concerted effort and it's going to take some investment of energy and it's going to take some convincing of healthcare workers that this is an important dimension. Okay, so we have another question from Julieta. Uh, which could be the action of melatonin for the balance between parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system and the inflammation? Uh, <clears throat> what we found in, in our work is mentioned that uh, there's an existing literature on sympathetic uh, activity being a risk factor for a cardiac event uh, or for uh, a, 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 an event following recovery. But what we find is that as long as you have the parasympathetic along with it, that seems to dampen some of the inflammatory effects of the sympathetic. And as a matter of fact, in our studies, the worst thing you can have is no autonomic control. Uh, the lack of autonomic flexibility where the body can't respond effectively because there's no uh, uh, resources there to regulate. So I, I, I think it's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's really maintaining a balance between those two branches uh, and rather than increasing one and decreasing the other systematically or across the board. I think it's maintaining a healthy balance between the two. Okay. 
Thank you. The, that same person is asking uh, what could be the action of melatonin for the balance between these two systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic in case of the inflammation? <clears throat> yeah, good question. There's, there's certainly some interactions there. And, and one of the things we know about loneliness is that it disrupts sleep and it disrupts sleep patterns. And, <coughs> excuse me. And so uh, it's uh, very likely to play a role. I, I don't think we know enough right now to say precisely how, but it would, uh, I'm, I'm sure there is an important influence of the melatonin system and, and sleep-waking cycles on overall autonomic regulation and immune function. Is that a sufficiently roundabout way of getting out of answering that question? <laughs> we have another question. Okay. Um, in the case of animal models, we speak of social isolation restricting social contact. How much of this isolation does a human need to experience the effects on health? It varies incredibly uh, from individual to individual. Some people really need a rich social environment in order to feel connected. And some people may only need one or two people uh, to, to feel socially enriched. And so it, it isn't, it, it can't be, it can't be measured by social numbers. It is a perception. Loneliness is a personal perception of your state of affairs, whether it's socially enriched or, or not. It's how we think about how we perceive our social status in the world. Uh, so there's not a simple answer to that. Thank you. We have an, a last question that says, do you think that we confuse physical isolation with social isolation with, uh, with measures of social distancing? distancing? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I despise the the phrase social distancing. Uh, you want to achieve physical distance, not social distance. But somehow that is a catch all phrase that I think has led to the uh, uh, confusion or lack of distinction between socially distancing and physical distancing. Thank you. And, and adding to this, do you think people justify not complying with Lockdown, measure, lockdown measures, uh, bringing up the importance of social contact for humans. There seems to be a lack of precision, precision between physical and social isolation, says our attendee. To, to some extent, yes. I think to, to some extent, um, non-compliance is, is just a, a personal decision. Uh, uh, certainly, we see it here in the States a lot that, that it's considered to be an infringement on personal liberty, not necessarily that they would avail themselves of it otherwise, but um, so I think you have some of, some of both factors operating, some uh, of, of uh, the physical distancing um, again related to the earlier question self-imposed versus uh, a government imposed that can lead to a difference in in reactions to that isolation thank you I think we have time for one more question. It says, um, do you think 
solitude or loneliness is related to a an intellectual or cognitive improvement? Yes, I do. Um, and not just uh, uh, not just the autonomic nervous system, but the endocrine system in general. Yes, I, I, I think they very much go together. Thank you, Professor. And thank so, you one more time. I believe yes. This, thank you. This has been the end of your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Bergson, to be uh, to be here for being here with us. It has been an honor to have you here. It is incredible to have such a high level intellectual, especially to us in Latin America, where there has been a huge gap to have uh, scientifics like in our countries. And of course, to ha you have contributed to close that gap. To our participants, thank you for joining us. Remember to take advantage of the networking section. Here you can schedule brief meetings with our experts. I invite thank you, you. I also invite you. Thank you yes. for the invitation. Thanks to you. I also invite our participants to continue actively participating in the rest of the conferences. Have a really nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.